Hello, today we're continuing in our A-level physics revision series looking at means of sensing and today and in this series we're going to be looking at direct sensing. A sensing device is something which changes its physical properties in some way. A sensing device changes its physical properties when something changes in the outside world. For example, if you've got a sensing device that is going to check whether the temperature falls, you want something about that sensing device to change when the temperature falls such that you can detect that. Or you might want a sensing device to tell you if light levels fall below a certain level. So something's got to change in order for you to detect that. And that has got to be able to be fed through into some kind of processing unit and that in turn can be fed through to some kind of output device. What this effectively means is that you can put the sensing device into some kind of electronic circuit so that it will automatically detect when something changes and do something about it. For example, suppose we want something to tell us if light levels get too low and then to switch on a light so that it becomes brighter. We want what's called a light dependent resistor. This is a material that's made out of cadmium sulphide. Cadmium is a metal. And the way it works is basically the photoelectric effect. That as light falls onto the metal, so it will um, cause uh, electrons to be released from the atoms. This is the essential element of the photoelectric effect. And then there will be more electrons in the material and consequently there will be more free electrons to move and so the resistance will go down as the light increases. Similarly, if light levels fall, the resistance will go up. Typically in moonlight, one of these devices will have a resistance of about one mega ohm, but in sunlight it will have a resistance of about 100 ohms. So there's a major change in the resistance depending on how much light is actually falling on the light dependent resistor. It should however be pointed out that it is not necessarily the case, and in this case it isn't the case, that the resistance and the light are related according to a straight line. In other words, the resistance doesn't fall in a proportionate way as the level of light increases, it will have a curve and that means you have to calibrate the device with known levels of light. We'll see how we can use this in a circuit in just a little while, but now let's think of a different type of detector, a temperature detector. Well, there are many objects where as the resistance, sorry, as the temperature increases, the resistance increases. That's actually true of, say, an ordinary filament bulb. And that's a reason why filament bulbs tend to blow when uh, you first switch them on. It is because they are cold, and so when they are cold, the resistance is low, which means the current is high. So when you first switch on a filament bulb, a low resistance means you get a high current, which means that's if, if the filament is in any way um, worn, that's when the high current is most likely to damage it. But as the temperature rises, so the resistance of the fil filament bulb rises and the current falls. However, there is a device called a thermistor, for which this is the usual symbol. And a thermistor has the characteristic that as the temperature increases, the resistance increases dramatically. So there's a major change of resistance. There is also a device called a negative temperature coefficient thermistor, which actually does it the other way around. As the temperature increases, the resistance decreases. And again, this is not linear. So if we plot resistance against temperature, we get a curve that looks like this. And once again, that means that you need to calibrate the device, measuring its resistance at each stage for a known temperature, and then you know how that device is going to vary as the temperature changes. Some materials can detect pressure using what's called the piezoelectric effect. 
And this is a piezoelectric transducer. A transducer is any device that converts energy from one form to another. And if you take a quartz crystal, the quality about a quartz crystal is that when it is in an unstressed state, then its ions, its positive and its negative ions, are lined up in a symmetrical way. But if you apply pressure to the quartz crystal, or indeed if you attempt to stretch it, then the ions become distorted and you end up with a potential difference across the crystal. So you've got a voltage created by pressure. And if you connect electrodes to the crystal by putting perhaps a metal plate on either side of the crystal, then you can actually use that voltage in a circuit. And the polarity of the voltage will depend on whether it's being squashed or stretched, if the pressure is down or the pressure is up. Sound waves, of course, are variations of pressure in the air. They are longitudinal waves and the molecules in the air are vibrating backwards and forwards, sometimes um, in a very dense way, sometimes in a light way. But you've got a variation in pressure. And if that variation in pressure hits the quartz crystal, then those variations in pressure will produce variations in the output voltage of the distorted quartz crystal atoms. And so effectively, you've got a very simple microphone. The sound waves hit the quartz crystal. The variations in pressure produce a variated or varied um, voltage output. And that voltage output is an analogous, in other words, it's an analog signal of the sound that came in, a simple microphone. You can construct a gauge, which is called a metal wire strain gauge, to tell you if there is a strain on a material. This is wire and it's being placed in a plastic container or plastic sheet and it is as it were fixed in that plastic sheet. If you now stretch the sheet the wire itself will be stretched and that means it will undergo a strain. And you'll recall that Young's modulus is stress divided by strain. Stress is the force divided by the area and strain is the extension, which we will call delta L, divided by L. It's the extension of a wire. As you stretch a wire, the extension is delta L. L is the original length. So stress divided by strain is F divided by A divided by delta L divided by L. And that, of course, becomes F L divided by delta L A. It is actually true that the wire will become very, very slightly smaller in cross-sectional area, but by such a small amount that we can largely ignore it. Now we know that the resistance, the electrical resistance of a cable or a wire is equal to the resistivity, which is constant for any given material, times the length of the wire divided by the cross-sectional area of the wire. If the wire is stretched because you stretch this material, put it on a, you give it a, a force, then the change in resistance, R plus delta R, will equal rho into L plus delta L, because the length of the wire has increased by delta L, divided by A, which as I say, changes slightly, but infinitesimally and can be ignored. And if you work that through, you will find that delta R, the change in resistance, is rho times delta L divided by a. In other words, the change in resistance is proportional to the change in length. Now you'll see that apart from the quartz crystal, which did actually immediately generate a changing voltage if you squash it, the other devices that we've looked at, the uh, light sensitive device, the temperature sensitive device, and the, as it were, pressure sensitive device, all change resistance. And the question is, 
how can we get that to equate to a change in output voltage? Because that's what you usually need in a circuit. And the way it is done is in a circuit like this. You have a battery, you have a fixed resistance, which is called R1, and then you have your sensing device, which is going to change resistance depending on whether the light changes or the heat changes or the pressure changes, whatever it happens to be. And then we simply measure the voltage across this point here. That is what's called the output voltage. Let this resistance be R2 and that is going to change according to the conditions that apply to that sensing device. Well now we can say that V, which is the output voltage, is going to be R2 divided by R1 plus R2 of this battery. We'll give that the EMF E. So effectively all we've got is a voltage splitter and this is now going to give us a, a voltage output that we can use to um, act and take some action as a consequence of what's happening with the sensing device and we'll come on to that in a moment. The important thing is that V will vary as R2 varies. Now in order to use that uh, voltage output to do something as a consequence of the sensing device, for example to turn the thermostat on or off or to turn the light on or off, we need uh, some electronic circuitry and what we're going to need is an operational amplifier. Now I'm not going to describe the operational amplifier in detail here, I'll probably make a separate video on that, but let's just tell you what the main features of the operational amplifier are. You have the following. Firstly you need to power the amplifier and you do that with a usually just a battery power supply from the battery positive and negative. This is the output and this is what is called the inverting input and this is what is called the non-inverting input. And for reasons which I won't explain here, but as I say, I'll probably make another video, the output, that's this voltage output here, is equal to A naught times V plus minus V minus, where V plus is that value and V minus is that value. And A naught is the open loop gain of the operational amplifier, or it's the amplification factor. So basically, if you have two inputs, then the difference between the two, which is V plus minus V minus, is amplified by the gain factor to produce the output. But you can see that the polarity of the voltage out will depend on whether V plus is bigger than V minus or smaller. If V plus is bigger than V minus, V out will be positive. If V plus is smaller than V minus, V out will be negative. Now you cannot get something for nothing and consequently the output can never be greater than the power supply that you are providing to the um, operational amplifier. And when when in theory it ought to be greater, but it can't be, it is said that the amplifier is saturated. So how is that going to help us with our sensing device? Well, I'll draw the diagram first and then I'll explain what's going on. So here is the operational amplifier. It's got two inputs to the minus and the plus. It's got the output and it's got the power supply coming in. We'll connect the power supply here and then on this side we're going to have 
two resistances of the same value. Here. R1. So two resistances. And I think you'll see that the effect of that will be that the voltage here, we'll call that the voltage of the source, will be split in two so that the voltage at this point going into the minus part of the power amplifier will be Vs over 2. I should just explain of course that lines that cross like this are not actually touching one another. It's almost as though one is going over the other. They don't touch. They only touch if there is a dot. So wherever you've got a junction or appear to have a junction, only if you've got a dot do the wires actually connect. Where you've got a crossing point like this, it simply means the two wires cross one another, but they don't actually electrically connect. And then here, we're going to have another resistance splitter. This is the sensing device whose resistance is going to change. And here is just another standard resistor. We'll call that R2 and we might as well call this R3, and R3 is going to vary because that is the sensing device. And then finally, we're going to put another battery into the circuit like this. Remember, this is not a connecting point. This cable just goes straight up here. So essentially, you've got these two batteries feeding the operational amplifier to give it its main source of power. And this line here is earthed. Now hopefully you can see what's going to happen. We know that as far as the negative input here is concerned, which is called the inverting input, that is always going to be half of the Vs because we've got two equal resistors that are effectively producing a voltage drop of a half that is going into the inverting input. Over here, for the non-inverting input, we've got two resistors and the value of the voltage that is going into the non-inverting input will depend on uh, the value of R3. If R3 is very small, then the voltage here will be very much less than Vs over 2. If R3 is much bigger than R2, then uh, the non-inverting input voltage is going to be much greater than Vs over 2. Let's just write that down. If R3 is greater than R2, then more, essentially you've got more than a half split. So that means that you're going to have a higher voltage here than here, because this is a pure half split of Vs. Whereas here you will have R3 over R3 plus R2, and that's much more than a half if R3 is greater than R2. And so in those circumstances, V plus, that's the voltage here, will be greater than V minus, which is the voltage here. And if V plus is greater than V minus, then according to this formula, the output voltage will be positive. So that means V output is positive. If on the other hand R3, that is the sensory device, is less than R2, then V plus will be less than V minus, because now you're going to have less than half of Vs going into the non-inverting input, but you've got half of Vs going into the inverting input, so V plus is going to be less than V minus, and according to that formula, that means that V out will be negative. So that means that the voltage output will either be positive or negative depending on those circumstances. So let's suppose that the sensing device is a light sensor. And let's suppose that it's dark. If it's dark, the resistance is going to be very high. That means that R3 will be greater than R2, V plus will be greater than V minus, and so the output voltage will be positive. 
Now let's suppose it gets light. That means that the resistance will fall. If it falls below the value of R3, so R3 is, uh, sorry, if it falls below the value of R2, so R3 is now less than R2, V plus will be less than V minus and you'll get a negative output. And so if you arrange it such that just at the point that you want your light to go off or come on as the case may be, that's the point at which the voltage changes polarity. Then you can have a device or electrical circuit with a diode, as we'll come to in a moment, um, which will cause a current to flow to switch the light on.